eyes and moved, it will never move, even though the waves come crashing down. There's a tower on a hill, it's always strong, it will never shake, it was standing there before the world began. There's a wave that's coming in, washing over this town. It'll make or break us, reinvent us. Time to lay me down. On Christ's solid rock, we will stand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ's solid rock, we will stand. We'll climb. It was custom made to raise the sons and daughters of this earth. There's a sound that's coming in, rushing over this town. It'll make or break us, reinvent us. Time to lay me down. Oh, Christ, the solid rock, we will stand. says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the promise that we have in Christ. If you're dealing with any fear, anxiety, worry right now, those can be overcome by the faith that we have in our Lord. So join us in celebrating the fact that God is our solid rock.
Watching our 11 o'clock live service, we are so glad that you're here. And if you are visiting us for the first time, the first time you're seeing us online, make sure you go into the comments section and write new because we've got all of our staff, our pastors are online. They love to communicate with you. They love to pray with you, talk with you. And if you've got any prayer needs and uh, just anything that you just want discussed, we'd love to connect with you in some way. Also, Met Family, it's time for you to give the thumbs up. It's time to say hi to everybody because we have one of the friendliest churches you're ever going to want to be a part of. So come on, tell everybody hi, and let's continue to worship. Come on.
Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning and God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, God, that you are alive in us. That it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. God, thank you for being our rock. God, there are uncertain times when we worry and we have fears and anxieties. God, that our faith would point us back to you. God, that you will never leave or forsake us. God, I pray for every person watching online right now. God, that your Holy Spirit would just be in their homes. God, give them peace. Show them your love. God, that we would, walk, we would all come out of this stronger, stronger in you. God, I pray for the offering today, Lord, that you would use it in a mighty way, God, to bring people here that don't know you. God, I pray for Pastor Bill, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just fall on him. God, that his words would change us and help us become more like you. God, thank you for your son. Thank you for the faith that we have in you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to thank all of you for your faithful giving to the Met. It's because of your tithes and offerings that ministry happens. Here at the Met, we have made giving online easy, fast, and above all, safe. We have several ways for you to choose from. You can give through our website directly at metchurch.com. You can give on your Church Center app. You can text to give by texting any amount plus the keyword METCHURCH to 84321. Or you can drop off your gift at the front office. Again, thank you so much for your support. We look forward to seeing what God will do through your generosity. That was rejected and refused But he is the cornerstone That God Almighty has used Like a little lamb He came down to the children of men
Something that lives not from nature, but from God. Our real selves are, so to speak, all waiting for us in Him. When you've completely given up yourself to His personality, you will then, for the first time in your life, be developing into a real person. Because the very first step towards getting a real self is to forget about the self. Give up yourself and you'll find your real self. Lose your life and you'll save it. Submit to death, submit with every fiber of your being, and you'll find eternal life. I want to thank all of you for joining us again with our online service, and we are committed. Uh, to coming live each time we have a service scheduled. We're going to be bringing that service to you live as long as we're unable to meet together collectively. We're going to be coming uh, each weekend uh, to minister to you uh, by this means and on this platform. And I want to say thank you to our, our tech team. Uh, we have a very scaled down uh, group that are uh, enabling us to have this service. And I am so grateful for our tech team that makes sure that you can see us and hear us clearly. Of course, I want to thank our, our band and Rob and Laney who lead us in worship. Uh, we are so blessed, and I am so fortunate to be able to work with so many wonderful people. And then, of course, we want to continue to pray for all of those in the medical profession, our first responders, people who go out e every day and make uh, life continue to happen for all of us. And so let's pray for each other, and let's pray that soon this, uh, this problem that we're facing in our country will end. Here's what I know. This too will pass. I also know God is in perfect control. And uh, I know he has a plan, and eventually we'll be able to see and understand all that he was doing in the midst of this situation. And in this series we're doing called Paradox, we're looking each weekend at how two things that seem opposite of one another can be true. How different things can work together, though they seem at times to oppose one another. That's actually what a paradox is, uh, bittersweet. You can have happy and sad moments in your life. Uh, we have a bad nature, we have a new nature. Those are things that we deal with in our life each and every day. So we deal with a lot of paradoxes. There are a lot of dialectical illustrations in the Bible, a lot of paradoxical verses in the Bible. Uh, you see things like Romans 8, 28, where the Bible says God works all things together, good and bad, happy and sad, all those things together, God works those things ultimately for our good and his glory. It's a paradox, and God is good at working that out. We, we talk about going through the storms of life, and then you read the Bible, and the Bible says there can be peace in the storm. That's a paradox. Peace is shalom. It's not the cessation of war or the ending of conflict. It is peace in the middle of a conflict. Those two things can be true. Those two things can be happening at the same time. You can have your heart broken. You can be full of sorrow and yet at the same time be experiencing joy. So to have peace in a storm, to have joy and sorrow is paradoxical. And yet it is something that we experience all the time. And this weekend, guys, I want to talk to you for a little while about another paradox that we're all going through, and that is the reality, according to God's word, that you and I can be certain, and we can have certainty in the time of uncertainty. Now, these are truly uncertain times, but when you think about it, it isn't the first time we've gone through uncertainty. Uh, in each of our lives, we face periods of time 
uh, times of uncertainty. I know in Cindy's diagnosis and all through her journey with her health, it was uncertain times. So I know about uncertainty. Uh, many of you have gone through similar experiences of life. And so we all navigate through the uncertainties of life. They're there when you think about it each day. It's why we put a seatbelt on. It's because we're not certain. It's why we buy insurance. It's because we're not certain. It's why we buy a gun. Some of you are buying lots of guns. It's because it's times of uncertainty. And so I'm saying that the things that often drive our decisions and the things that often guide our lives are things out of a sense of uncertainty. And so you kind of get where I'm coming from uh, this morning, but I want to tell you that it is possible in the midst of uncertainty to have some things you're absolutely certain of. When you read the little first epistle of John, he says time and time again, I've written these things to you that you may know, that you may know. So God wants us to be certain about things. Now, there's some things that he says, Psalm 19, 7. He said, you can be uh, sure about his word. The Bible is a sure thing. It is a certain thing. We know uh, the nature of God is that he cannot lie. He will not lie. So you can be certain of his word. Isaiah 53, verse 4. He bears our griefs. He carries our sorrows. Isaiah said, you can be certain of that. When you're going through a time of grieving in your life or you're going through a sorrowful period in your life, he said, you can know God will come right alongside of you. He'll help you with that. Of that, I am certain. And then, of course, Revelation 22, verse 20, Jesus said, one of these days, you can be certain that I will come again. One day, Jesus Christ is going to come. So those are things, and there are many more things in the Bible, but those are a handful of things you and I can be absolutely certain of. But when you look at this idea of uncertainty, and you look at this time of uncertainty that we're living in, it's not unique to our generation. Every generation has dealt with uncertainty. All back in the Bible, you see every person that the Bible records, all the stories that are in there, all of the individuals, all of the people recorded there went through periods of uncertainty. They're good examples of good examples in the Bible. They're good examples of bad examples in the Bible. Some navigated it a little better than others. And I hope you and I can navigate through these waters of uncertainty with great certainty. And I hope we can do that very well. And I think one of the ways we do it is look at examples of people who have gone before us. What did they do? How did they respond? What did God do? How did he respond? And that's what I want to do just for a little while with you this morning is to look at the wanderings of Israel through the wilderness, right? As they had left Egypt and they were on their way to Canaan. Canaan was God's promised land. And even when you look at the way in which they went through that 40 years of confusion and uncertainty, how God showed up in their midst and gave them some things they could be absolutely certain of. But it wasn't just the people collectively, it was the leaders individually that dealt with uncertainty. Sometimes it's not the uncertainty that we face in the world, sometimes it's personal uncertainty. Sometimes the uncertainty comes from our mind and our our heart. We're not sure about ourselves personally. We're not certain of God's purpose for our life. You remember when God told Moses, you're going to lead Israel. You're going to lead them out of Egypt. You're going to lead them toward the promised land, the land of Canaan. And Moses was not certain. He goes, God, I don't know if I'm your guy. I mean, I, I'm not a great speaker. I'm not really a, a gifted leader. I, 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 don't, I, I don't think I'm the one you want to use to do that. And you read the exchange between Moses and God. It's in Exodus 4. And it's a great narrative. It's a great study in human nature how God was saying to Moses, no, I don't make mistakes. You're the one. I have equipped you. I've prepared you. In fact, God said, I'll give you the words to say. I'll write the script for you. Here's what you say when you go before Pharaoh. You say, tell him, I am has sent you and therefore let my people go. So God gave him exactly what to say. And Moses still pushes back, right? He still goes, oh man, I I, I just don't think I'm equipped. I don't think I'm the one. So you, you get this little pushback from Moses and God says, okay, let me give you another story. What's in your hand? Moses said, well, that's a stick, a rod, a staff. He goes, throw it on the ground. So he throws it on the ground. It becomes a snake. God says, pick it up. And I love that. God has a sense of humor, right? Pick up the snake. So he reaches down, he grabs it, and it becomes a staff again, a rod. And God was 
proving to him, I don't need what you don't have. I need what I've already gifted you with. I need what I have already placed in your hand. Here's the principle. God does not expect of us to do the things he has not equipped us to do. He doesn't ask of us to give the things that we do not have. He is looking for us to step up in a time of uncertainty to be certain that he has gifted and called us to do certain things and to be faithful in doing the thing that he's called us to do. Not rocket science. In fact, it wasn't just Moses, because a little later on, Joshua would succeed Moses. Joshua would actually finally lead Israel over into the Canaan land. And Joshua had the same struggles as Moses. And I love what God said to Joshua in Joshua 1. Several times he says, be of good courage, man. I know it's a difficult time, and I know it's a time of uncertainty, but have courage, be encouraged. And then he said to him, as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. I'm not going to leave you. I will not fail you, Joshua. And so I'm saying that even the leaders, even the people sometimes we look to, to set the example and to help us uh, get more insight into navigating through uncertain times, even those leaders oftentimes are uncertain themselves. So it's something that's universal. It's something that affects all of us to some degree or another. Every one of us deal with uncertainty. But in this great narrative and in this beautiful story of Israel, Israel as they made their way to the promised land. There are four things I want you to see. But let me set it up by reading you a text. It's here in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 8. God said to them, listen, I will bring you into the land. It's going to happen. God says, this is going to happen. I'm going to bring you through this. I'm going to bring you into this land, this land of Canaan. It's the land, notice now, that I swore to give to Abraham. Now you go back to Genesis 15 and you'll find that record. God said to Abraham, as far as your eyes can see, I'm going to give this land to my people. So God made that promise a long time ago. And then notice it now, it was communicated to Isaac and to Jacob, and then you know the story how that um, there was a famine in the land after in Jacob's uh, era. Uh, Joseph, he is the man God uses ultimately uh, to, to bring those 12 sons, the uh, 12 tribe leaders of Israel into Egypt. And they're there for that period of 400 years until finally it was God's time to raise up Moses and Joshua to lead them out of uh, uh, Egypt you have the exodus from Egypt, and then they're marching toward this promised land. So that's kind of the, the chronology of what had happened. And so God is kind of reciting that. I'm going to bring you into this land. I said I would give it to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and now I will give it to you for a possession. And he signed it, I am the Lord. Now here's what's incredible about that. God's promises don't always happen overnight, but God will keep his word. So the first thing I want you to know is his promise to them. It was a certainty. And in a time of uncertainty, you can know God will keep his promise. It's the first thing I want you to see, his promise to them. God said, look, I told Abraham, it was communicated generationally all the way down to Moses and, 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 and finally to Joshua. So I will keep my word. I, I've said before, God cannot lie. Not only cannot lie, can't even exaggerate. If God says something, it will absolutely come to pass. He had promised them this possession, this land called Canaan. Now, the possession was there. God preserved the possession because he was preparing his people. God will always preserve the possession while he prepares his person. So if it doesn't happen overnight, it's because it's not ready to happen. It's not God's timing for your life. He doesn't want you to go up like a rocket and come down like a rock. So God will take time. He will work with a sense of timing. He wants you to do what he wants you to do, but he wants you to do it when it's time. I talk about how, you know, your six or seven year old child, uh, if they want to run down to the store and get some milk and bread, maybe find toilet paper. <laughs> uh, you're not going to pitch them the keys and say, be careful, uh, hope you find it all. Now, you'll do that maybe in 10 or 11 years, but you're not going to do it now. Why? They're not ready for that. What's the point? The point is, if we know that about our kids, God knows that about his kids. He was saying to Abraham, you're not ready for this yet. I'm going to give you the promise, and it will be realized through Joshua but it's going to take time. I've got the possession, the possession is there. And by the way, God had the right to give the land to his people. Uh, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God created the world, he owns this world. So if he wants to give a piece of this world to some of his kids, that's his business, that's his land. 
So he preserved that possession, get it, while he was preparing his people. What I want you to miss in this was while they were going through the wilderness and while they were dealing with the uncertainty, God was certain in that he was going to keep, absolutely keep his promise to them. Now, I know a lot of times when you talk about Canaan, I I know sometimes in uh, theological circles, people will uh, say, well, Canaan is a a picture of heaven, right? Canaan uh, symbolizes heaven, but that's not really true. And I get the the imagery of crossing the Jordan. A lot of our songs had the idea of crossing Jordan being like going through a death experience, crossing Jordan in the waters of Jordan. I get that, and that's applicable, and there's relevance to that. But Canaan is not a a great picture of heaven, and here's why. Uh, First of all, uh, people got sick in Canaan. And the heaven we're going to, no one's going to get sick. Not only that, uh, God said, drive out the inhabitants of Canaan and possess the land. Uh, His people aren't going to go drive anybody out of heaven to possess heaven. Uh, There was war in Canaan. And the heaven we're going to, there's not going to be any more fighting. There's no more war. And I think one of the greatest thoughts is that the fact that people died in Canaan and no one will die in heaven. So Canaan is really not a great picture of heaven. Here's what Canaan pictures. Canaan pictures the fullness of the blessing, the favor of God that he desires for every one of his kids. It represents a place that you and I can possess where we enjoy God's favor, his blessings, his full. It's what God desires for each one of us to come into this possession, to come into this realm, to come into this place with him where we are experiencing his fullness each and every day. You see, you and I are connected to God two ways. We're connected with him, first of all, by relationship. He's our father and we're his child. That happens the moment we receive him. Nicodemus questioned Jesus in John 3 and said, how does this happen? And Jesus says, Nick, you have to be born again. And he goes, how, do I, how, how does that happen? I mean, I'm, I'm an old guy. I mean, I, we can't go through the birth process with mom again. What are you talking about? And Jesus says, no, you're misunderstanding. I'm using a, 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 you know, a, a term that you would understand. Born again, just as you were born physically, you have to be born spiritually. That was his point, born again. Now, by the way, it's not born again and again and again. It's just one time. So you must be born again. And so Jesus told Nicodemus that. So the relationship you have with Jesus is not through religion. It's not through ritual. It's not through your righteousness, your ability to be good. Jesus explained it in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except by me. Relationship, friend, is established the moment you humble your heart and swallow your pride and receive Jesus Christ into your life. That moment you enter this realm of God's uh, possession for you where he is your father, you are his child, you are connected to him, and the Bible says those the father has given me, no one shall take them out of my hand. Ephesians 1 says you are then sealed with the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption, meaning your your salvation is good until you get to heaven one day. So that's relationship. The second thing that connects us with God is fellowship. Now, relationship can never be broken. You can never not be the child of your parents. Biologically, genetically, you are always connected. You can never not be the child of your heavenly father. The Holy Spirit sealed you in the deal. He is inside of your heart and life today. Your home is in heaven. Jesus is your savior. God is your father. And so that relationship is eternal. But what can be broken is fellowship. You you are bound to God by, what is fellowship? It's our ability to talk and, and connect and walk with our savior. It is a relationship we have that is illustrated in our fellowship. Now look, you can be in a relationship with someone in your living room right now that you're not in fellowship with them. (laughs) I saw somebody put something out there that said, hey, while we're having this uh, shutdown, if something happens to me, investigate, right? So everybody's kind of getting tense a little bit around the casa. So I, I get that tension, but my point I don't want you to miss is you can have a relationship with someone you don't like them right now, right? You're out of fellowship with them. That happens with God. Uh, There are people that have uh, walked away from prayer and reading their Bible or or giving and serving and being a part of a ministry because of some experience and the root of that experience is some anger and disappointment with God. 
And after a period of time, God kind of brings them around and they come back and they reestablish not relationship because that never went away. They reestablish fellowship. And they say, I'm coming home. I'm like the prodigal. I'm returning to my father and I want things to be right again. Why? I want the fullness of God's joy. I want the peace that he provides. I, I, I want to have this certainty in my life, in this world of uncertainty. I don't want there to be any distance between me and my Savior. So you have, first of all, his promise to them. And by the way, when you read the Bible, it's full of promises. You'll find so many there. Here, here's what I would tell you to do. When you find a promise that strikes you, you know, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Um, you know, uh, 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 all the Father has given me are in my hand. No one will take them from my hand. When you find a promise, here's what you do. Mark it down. Write it down. If you don't, you'll forget it. Write it down. Number two, pray it in. Pray it in. Take a moment and say, Lord, help me to truly meditate and to, to uh, internalize this verse into my heart and mind. Right? So write it down. Pray it in. Number three, live it out. Just say, it's going to be my verse for today. I'm going to kind of walk in that promise because God cannot lie. So the first certainty you have was his promise to them. Here's the second certainty, and that was his provision for them. His provision for them. God was not going to send them into something that he would not provide for them there. God will never send you somewhere where he will not provide for you while you are there. It doesn't matter. God has promised he is bound by his word to meet your need. And in Israel's case, it involved the necessities of life. In fact, the psalmist would talk about later uh, God preparing a table in the wilderness for his people. God provided food. He provided water for them. He made sure they had what they needed to be able to live, their provision. In fact, in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, God said, I'll rain down heaven. I'll rain down rather bread from heaven. Uh, Exodus 17, verse 6, he said to Moses, strike the rock. Water will come out of the rock. What was he doing? He was saying, I'm not sending you out here into an uncertain world without the certainty of provision. I will absolutely take care of you. Listen to this promise. Uh, Philippians 4, 19. God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now get the wording of that. God will supply my needs my needs, these essential things that I, I need. God said, you partner with me, you walk into that realm of my fullness, and as a result, I'll provide for your needs. And notice where the provision is coming from. He didn't say out of my riches in heaven, because that would lead you to believe the reserves are being depleted each day. Out of would indicate there might be a time in heaven when the shelves are empty. When you're going looking for some bread or toilet paper, what? all of a sudden you can't find it there, right? Shelves are empty. He didn't say, out of my riches and glory. He said, according to. Meaning that I can provide what you need without ever touching the reserves that I have in heaven. My reserves will never be depleted. God will never be in a place with his people where he is unable to provide what they need. So what are you worried about? God has promised provision. And yet it's... You know, it's, it's common in a time like this when you're uncertain with your job and with the economy and all that's going on. It's easy to be uncertain about those necessities. Jesus talked to people who were feeling that uncertainty in Matthew 6, remember? And when you read Matthew 6, he says you're worried uh, about things that you shouldn't be worried about. You're worried about what you're going to wear. You're worried about what you're going to eat. He said, I get that, but don't worry about that. I'm going to take care of you. And Jesus reminds them, here's the best way to deal with the anxiety over those things, he says, to pray. And in Matthew 6, he gives them the model prayer. Remember, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And part of the prayer, remember this, give us this day, what? Our daily bread. Not bread for the week, bread for the day. God said, I'll give you, just like manna from heaven, every morning they came out and picked that bread up God had provided. He's saying, I'm promising you, when you pray, I will give you daily bread. I'll meet the provision of your life. And so he's saying the way to deal with the anxiety and the worry is to pray. Remember what Paul said back in Philippians 4 again. He said up in verse 8, he says, uh, don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious for anything. You say, how do you pull that off? Well, everything through prayer, what Jesus taught, and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I've said this before, you cannot pray and worry about the same thing at the same time. 
So whatever you're worried about today, connect it with prayer. Every time you worry about it, pray about it. And God has this great way of transferring that burden from your shoulder over to his. And he was telling the people in his day, man, don't worry. I got you. I got this. And here's what I know about your kids in your house right now. None of them are worried about what you're going to fix them for lunch. They probably have been snacking since those little boogers have woke up. So they're not, but here's what I, they're not worried. They're not worried about any, they're not worried about the grocery stores. Not, you know why? Because they know you love them and they know you'll provide for them. They know you got them. And I'm saying if that's true of you and me and our kids, how much more true is that about our heavenly father and us? I think God's looking down out of heaven right now saying, I got you and I got this. I've got a promise I've made to you. I won't leave you or forsake you. And if you'll let me, I'll provide and I'll make sure your necessities are met. I remember what David wrote in the Psalms. He said, I'm an old man now, but once I was young. And here's what he said, I've never seen his righteous forsaken. He said, I've never seen his seed begging bread. The old hymn writer wrote, be not dismayed, whate'er be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. You don't have a need that he cannot meet. By the way, you don't have a sin that he can't forgive. You don't have a burden that he cannot lift. You don't have a problem he cannot solve. He's the provider. It's a promise. It's something you can be absolutely certain of in this world of uncertainty. So to get you through the uncertainty, Jesus said, pray. Just humble your heart and pray about what you worry about. Now, the reason that was significant, because back in his day, people had failed to pray. And largely they had failed to pray because they weren't taught properly how to pray. Many of the rabbis made pray, prayer so difficult and so uh, you know, unattainable that the common man that wasn't really schooled in religion didn't think he was qualified to pray. For example, they taught that your prayer has to have a certain form. You have to have certain words in the prayer. It has to have certain structure. And if it isn't structured in the proper way, God won't receive it. He won't hear it. Uh, it, it reminds me of that idea that somebody says, well, I need to say my prayers. Well, I get you say a prayer, you write it down and you teach kids how to pray. Jesus gave us the model prayer, teaching us how to pray. But reality is prayer is talking to God. You don't, you don't say a conversation, you have one. You don't pray a prayer. I mean, you don't say a prayer, you pray a prayer. <laughs> That's what he meant by vain repetition is when I say the same thing over and over and over the same way. You, you wouldn't get by that if you're in a relationship with someone. If every time you saw the person that you're in a relationship with and you just read them a prepared script, that's saying a prayer. What they want from you is openness and transparency and honesty. And so when you're doing that, you're praying a prayer. So I'm just saying they quit praying because they thought prayer had to be something you say structurally. It had to be structured and had to have a certain form. Then they also taught that you had to connect that right prayer with the right circumstance. So if you were praying about something different and you were trying to bend this prayer into that circumstance, God wouldn't hear you either. They said, well, you have to pray at certain times of the day, like God keeps office hours. And so the point is, it stagnated. And Jesus came on the scene and said, no, no, don't do that. Consider God like a father. You go to him with honesty and openness and transparency. And when you do that, he meets those needs. And when you do that, he lifts the anxiety. So Israel was learning that second certainty is not only of God's promise to them, but he was learning about God's provision for them. Thirdly and hurriedly, he learned, they learned also about this certainty of his presence with them. His presence with them. God was with them. I mean, he appeared, look at it, uh, Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. By the day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So God was with them. He said, my presence is going to be with you. And let me tell you something. One of the greatest assurances that you can have when you go through uncertain times is the fact you're not alone. God is with you. He's promised. He is providing. And his presence is there. In Israel, in the midst of the wilderness, God said, man, when you look up and see that massive cloud above you, I'm there. At night, when you're fearful and things sometimes are worse at night, he said, and you see that fire that is giving light and warmth, he said, I'm there. I'm there to shelter you. I'm there to warm your heart. I'm there in those dark moments. I'm there in those uh, dreary moments. He never leaves us. 
He never forsakes us. Exodus chapter 33, verse 14. My presence will go with you. Listen, I'll give you rest. You know what I think a lot of you need this morning? You need rest. I don't mean kick back on the couch kind of rest. I mean rest for your mind, rest for your heart. I found this in my life. It's possible to be stressed. It's possible to be hurting. It's possible to have grief. And you're not really in the moment. You can be around a lot of people and feel alone. You can be talking to someone and not really be with that someone. And that happens a lot of times when there's unrest in our minds. We're not in the moment because we're stressed about the uncertainty. And God's promise is, look, when you're really in my presence and you know that I'm not going to leave you and I've got this and I'm going to take care of you, I'll give you rest. I'll let your mind slow down. You try to sleep, your mind's just not away. It's just racing. It's wide away. He said, I'll calm you down. I'll give you peace. I'll give you rest. He said, I'm there. Let me give you the verse I read last week, the 139th Psalm, verse 8. David said, if I go up to the heavens, Lord, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your right hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. God's in your world right now. He is understanding what you're going through. There's nothing you can feel that he doesn't comprehend. Remember Hebrews said, we don't have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was in all points tempted and tested as we are, yet he was without sin. So I just want you to know in a time of uncertainty, you can be certain of his promise, of his provision, of his presence. And number four, and finally, they learn something of his protection of them. God's going to protect them. He's going to take care of them. He's not sending them into a dangerous area that he cannot protect them. He, he's going to absolutely take care of them. And they learned that no sooner had they left Egypt. Remember, Pharaoh finally let them go. And they're making their way to the Red Sea. And all of a sudden, they're at this huge, massive Red Sea. And Pharaoh changes his mind. So he and the army is coming after them from behind. And scouts see them. And they're in this dilemma of being between the devil and the deep blue sea, right? And all of a sudden, Moses goes to God and goes, what are you doing? And God said, I got you. You're going to be okay. I'm protecting my people. We're going to be okay. Moses, stand on the rock. Lift your arms. I mean, you saw the movie. And as he lifts his arms, the water parts. And the Bible says his people went through on dry ground. What was he saying to them right out of Egypt? I got you. I'm going to protect you. I'm not going to send you out into uncharted waters that my presence won't be with you, that my protection will not be over you. And I want to say to your heart this morning, he's got you. He'll protect you. He loves you, friend, more than you love you. You might not die for you, but he did. I said earlier, there's nothing you can do for him to love you more. There's nothing you can do for him to love you less. He will protect you, absolutely protect you. Let me give you a beautiful psalm to read, the 91st Psalm. And by the way, when you talk about the psalm, they're, they're not chapters like the other books of the Bible are. The, each psalm is individual. It's a songbook. It's Psalm 91, not Psalm chapter 91, Psalm 91. And so in Psalm 91, it's a beautiful promise of God's protection for his people. So read that before you go to bed. Here's a few verses I lifted out of it. Verse 4, he will cover you with his feathers. You will take refuge under his wings. His faithfulness will be a protective shield. When Paul, I mean, when David was writing that, he had this imagery of God like a mother eagle protecting her young. Those babies, they, they might have been stressing about being hungry, but they weren't stressing about being in danger. As long as their eyes were on mama bird, man, she had baby birds, they were going to be fine. And let me tell you, your heavenly father, his wings cover you. And you may be stressing about a lot of stuff, but you don't have to stress about the fact he's your protector and he is your provider. Listen to what it says down in verse 6. Even the plagues that stalks in darkness, the pestilence, the disease that ravages at noon. He says, I got you. I can protect you. Verses 11 and 12. He'll command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. That's both now and forever. He said, I've got angels that are looking out for you. And finally, verses 15 and 16. He says, when he calls to me, God said, I'll answer him. I'll be with him, note now, in trouble. I will rescue and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. God's got you this morning. He's promised that protection. And those are just four things that you can be absolutely certain of. And here's what I would say to you as I close this morning. 
If you've never trusted Christ, if you've never connected with your Creator, what an incredible time this could be in your life. What a wonderful day this could be for you. I don't believe there's accidents. I don't believe any of this has caught God by surprise. I don't think it's an accident you're watching the service today. I think the providence of God brought you to this place, this moment, this time, for this purpose, and that is for Him to reach out to you. So I would encourage you, if you've never received Christ right now, humble your heart, swallow your pride. Pray this simple prayer with me right now. Just say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on a cross. I believe you rose on Easter. And God, I'm tired of being so uncertain about my life. And so with all that I know about me, I now trust all that I know about you. Come into my heart this moment. Forgive my sin. One day, I pray, I will be in heaven with you. Thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me today, I'd love to know about it. Regardless of the platform you may be watching this service on, just email me, or you can even make it known on that platform. You can say, I prayed with Bill to receive Christ today. Or you can email me at bramsey at metchurch.com. I'd love to receive that and hear back from you. That's what we exist as a church primarily to do. That's to connect people with God. It's in our mission statement. And then we want to get you connected with one another. So I want to thank, thank all of you who've watched these services this weekend for the thousands that have been tuning in and watching. I'm praying that God will bless you and strengthen you. And I'm praying that in this world of uncertainty, you'll find the certainty that is in his word. Continue to pray for one another. Continue to pray for our country, even our world. And I believe God has a purpose in through, in through this. We're continuing to take care of families each week. Hundreds of people, uh, because of your generosity, were able to provide food for them, taking care of hundreds of children. And so we'll continue to do that. And we're thankful for this ministry that continues to happen. We're just doing it in a different way. So uh, Jesus said, I'll establish my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So we're going to be okay. Thank you for watching. God bless you. I love you guys. I look forward to the time we can meet uh, each other once again. I'll see you soon. so much for watching online with us. If you have any questions or prayer requests, please contact us so that we can follow up with you this week by visiting metchurch.com. We look forward to seeing you again next week.